Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another SWART presentation via webinar. Today we have a webinar on shortness of breath, a complaint with many faces. So we're going to talk about the differentiations between COPD, CHF. We'll talk about wheezing, and we'll also talk about crackles. And, and sometimes that crackles aren't always CHF, and wheezes aren't always uh, asthma. So today presenting, we have Dr. Chris Lee, PGY2 in emergency medicine, and Dr. Matt Davis, uh, our Interim Medical Director for Education here at SWARP. If, for whatever reason, this is your first webinar with us, what you're going to see is a PowerPoint presentation and the presenters talking over the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, also be aware that we do have four poll questions today, so do keep close to your computer um, and do participate. That's how we measure your participation to give you CE marks, uh, sorry, CE points. So do participate in those polls. We'll be reading out the questions as well as showing you the polls over, uh, over the PowerPoint slide. So if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, you're welcome to ask them in the question box attached to your control panel. So you can type those questions out to me throughout the presentation, and I'll have them answered. Uh, if anyone wants to ask any live questions at the end of the presentation, you're welcome to do so. And uh, in order to let me know that you do have a question live, you'll need a microphone, and you'll need to click on the little hand icon in the top left-hand corner of your control panel. Once I see that you have your hand up, I can click on that, unmute you, and then you can talk live. But we'll keep those till the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions throughout, just uh, type them up to me in the question box, and we'll have them answered live. And so without further ado, I will present uh, Dr. Chris Lee and Dr. Matt Davis. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Stephanie, for that. It's Matt here. I'm uh, joined with, uh, here with uh, Chris Lee. Uh, Chris is a second-year resident here in emergency medicine, and he spent the last month with us at Bayes Hospital. Uh, Chris has an interest in disaster medicine and actually completing some research in that area with Dr. Pettit. Um, and uh, today he is going to be talking to us about shortness of breath. So without further ado, here is Dr. Lee. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, and I uh, just want to say uh, thanks to Dr. Davis for uh, helping me out with setting up this webinar. Um, and for all the guidance uh, thus far. So today we're talking about shortness of breath, and it's one of those uh, it's one of those complaints that um, that happen all the time, and often they can lead to not very uh, important uh, or not very serious uh, outcomes. But sometimes, when people are extremely short of breath, then um, they can get us uh, you know quite anxious. And to be honest. Even now, at this level of training, you know, I still get quite anxious when people come into the emergency room very short of breath. And I'm sure that as you've gone out uh, and served the community, you've found people that are extremely short of breath. And it's a very frightening thing to, to deal with because these people, they can't breathe. And when they can't breathe, you can't breathe, basically. So we want to develop a, a way to approach this short of breath patient so that we can in a systematic way, make sure that the right patient gets the right treatment. And when we're anxious, we need a structured way so that we don't forget things. So that's what we're going to try to do today. So our objectives are really just to, again, develop that comprehensive pre-hospital differential diagnosis of shortness, of shortness of breath so that we're making sure that we cover all the bases of why a person can be short of breath. And then develop a way to distinguish between those causes and go through how we can treat some of those things. So how are we going to do that today? Well, we'll go through a, a few uh, cases just to, just to delineate some of the common pitfalls that can happen when uh, we're assessing someone that's short of breath. And then we'll go into an approach uh, for the pre-hospital setting of uh, how I think it's a good way to approach someone that's short of breath. And then, of course, we'll review the protocols and how we're uh, able to treat these patients. So, case one. Try to picture a 76-year-old female. She's got a history of angina, COPD, she's had a heart attack in the past, or an angioplasty, and she's a type 2 diabetic. She's been getting progressively short of breath since the holiday started, and she has trouble lying down. She sleeps in a recliner, which is usual, but she's sleeping more upright these days, and she's always short of breath worse at night. She still smokes, you know, half a pack a day, 
and if you think tougher is for a COPD, but that's really not helping your shortness of breath. So you go to the assessor, and her, uh, her vital signs are as bad side. She's afebrile, 36 to 8, heart rate of 98, blood pressure is 104 over 78, and her rest rate is 24. She's not satting too well at 91%. So you take a you take a quick listen to her and she she's got wheezes bilaterally. Hmm. You know, from her story, from her story, she sounds more like a, a CHF type of presentation, you know, she's not sleeping very well at night when she lies down, all the water re redistributes to her to her lungs. But she's got wheezes. So doesn't doesn't wheezes mean asthma and doesn't wheezes mean C O P D? Well, not necessarily you can have something called a cardiac wheeze. So wheezes don't necessarily mean COPD. So that's one of the, the things we want to take, take home today is that your physical exam doesn't necessarily drive your diagnosis. And history is one of those things that we need to pay more attention to. So let's see in case two, see, if that, uh, see what happens here. So try to picture an 81-year-old male, history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, dyslipidemia, MI, Stroke in the past, he's got speech and swallowing deficits. This guy's a vascular path. But he's eating dinner and he's acutely short of breath while he's eating dinner. And, you know, he's got pleuritic chest pain, so he has some pain when he's breathing in. And he thought this was his MI pain because he's had it before, so he takes nitro. But he's got, he's got no benefit with his nitro. His vital signs, he's afebrile, he's got heart rate of 92, blood pressure of 147, 93, not bad, and rest rate of 20. His oxygen saturation is only 94% of room air. So you take a listen to him, he's got frackles at the bases. So what's going on? Does, does this sound like a CHF exacerbation? Doesn't crackles mean CHF? Not necessarily. And this gentleman, you know, he's got speech and swallowing deficits. While he was eating dinner, he started getting short of breath. Did he aspirate? Does he, got, does he have chemical pneumonitis? Does he have aspiration pneumonia that can cause these crackles? Sure, it definitely can. So crackles doesn't necessarily mean CHF as well. So again, your physical exam doesn't drive your diagnosis. I know that we're not necessarily looking for diagnosis in a pre-hospital setting, but don't let your physical exam just drive what the possible diagnosis could be when you're thinking about it. Think about the history. Okay. How about case three? We've got a nine-year-old boy. He showed a breath for the past day or so. You know, he's been feeling generally unwell for a couple days, but today it's worse, so that's why the parents call. He's very fatigued, nauseous, vomiting, confused, and even complaining of thirst. He looks dehydrated when you take a look at him, and he's drowsy. He's hyperpnic, so he's breathing deep and fast. He's febrile, 37.6, heart rate's 128, blood pressure is 102 over 66. And he's packing away, breathing at a rate of 34, his oxygen saturation is quite good, 99%. And when you take a, when you take a listen to him, his, he's got normal breath sounds. That doesn't make sense. This kid's short of breath. Why is he sound normal? Why is there nothing going on in his lungs? Well, there's other things that could be driving shortness of breath as well. This kid sounds like a DKA, so uh, a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. You got metabolic acidosis that's driving his respiratory rate so that he can buffer all the acid that he's making. So there's lots of causes of shortness of breath, and that's what we want to get into. Thanks for that, Chris. I mean, just three case studies there and three different causes of shortness of breath. I'm sure you could spend the entire hour just going through different cases, going over all the different causes of shortness of breath. Um, the common things being common, uh, you know, really COPD, asthma, CHF, uh, are the big ones, so we'll uh, we'll discuss that a bit more. Uh, but you're also going to present kind of in the upcoming slides here too, just how many causes of shortness of breath there really are. And in terms of the pre-hospital setting, you know, we're not expecting diagnosis to be made, but just keep your mind open that there are, are numerous causes of why people can be short of breath. And even in the emergency department, sometimes we don't even figure out why the patient is short of breath, and it takes a hospital admission uh, to figure these things out. Yep, that's exactly right, Matt. Thanks for that point. Um, and so that's what we're going to go into now, just how do we approach these patients and how can we develop a good way 
of uh, making differential diagonals in the short term. Well, I think a good way to do that is really just to de define what we're talking about today, and that's dyspnea. So dyspnea is, I found a few different um, definitions here. Uh, one of them is a sensation of breathlessness and the patient's reaction to that sensation. And the other is an imbalance of the perceived need to breathe and the perceived ability to breathe. So that's an interesting way of putting it too. So it's a perceived need and a perceived ability. So if, you're, if your brain is perceiving that you are unable to breathe, you'll be dyspnea. And why would the brain think that? Well, let's get into why we breathe and how our brain thinks that we're not getting enough to breathe. I think that's a good place to start. Well, we all know that we breathe to bring oxygen in. Oxygen is used in cellular metabolism to create energy so that our body can do all of its bodily functions. And the oxygen, the amount of oxygen in our blood is sensed by the carotid bodies, and these carotid bodies are in the carotid arteries in our neck. But how do we bring this oxygen in? Well, there's two main players in that. One is the diaphragm, and the one's the thoracic cage. The diaphragm, when it contracts, it moves down. And the thoracic the cage, the muscles around the thoracic cage, when they contract, they cause the thoracic cage to expand. And what this does is, if you picture it here, as the diaphragm contracts and moves down, and the thorax expands and moves out, it creates a larger volume in the thorax. And the lungs are adherent to the thoracic cage and the diaphragm by the pleura. And it's adherent to that, and so when the thoracic cage volume expands, the lungs expand. And when the lungs expand, they create a negative pressure relative to the atmospheric pressure, and that draws air in. That air enters the alveoli, and at the alveoli level, oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide. You'll see that over here. So carbon dioxide then enters the lungs in a gas exchange mechanism that we just described. And through the trachea, the CO2 is then passed and expired through the nose and the mouth. And the amount of CO2 in the blood is monitored by the medulla oblongata, which is in the brain stem. So, all of these mechanisms are involved in getting oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. And then oxygen needs to be distributed to the body, and that's using the heart. And we know these, we know these things, so it's good to review. So if any of these mechanisms go wrong or go awry, or if anything's wrong with these, then your body's going to think that you're not breathing very well. So let's go through those things again. What are the major players? Well, we have a trachea here as a conduit for air. Thoracic cage, which is involved in uh, inspiration and also protection of the structures within the thoracic cage. We have the lungs, which, are, which is our gas exchange mechanism. We have a heart, which is the pump. And then we have a diaphragm. So, if you have something wrong with any of these things, again, your, your body will, will sense that you have difficulty breathing. So here's a few things that I think can go wrong. It's the trachea, the thoracic cage, the lungs, the heart, the diaphragm. Remember, the abdomen can also play a role. You can have metabolic and hematologic causes that make you short of breath. Even this list that I've generated here, this isn't a complete list of the causes of shortness of breath. These are all the things that we can consider. So as Matt was saying, there's lots of things that, that could be going on. We need to keep our mind open about it. But in the pre-hospital pre setting, is it really necessary for us to consider all these things? I don't think so. We need to keep in mind a few major players that we can actually do things about. And these are them. And I want to go into all of these things and each of these things just to just to uh, uh, go into them further so that we understand them and see what we can do about them. Actually, Chris, before we jump into the actual patho, why don't we launch our first poll? Uh, so the first poll question here, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more of the anatomy. So the question is, 
Uh, initiating inspiration involves which of the following? So A would be contraction of the abdominal muscles, B expansion of the thoracic cage, C contraction of the diaphragm, and option D should read both B and C. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to answer those. Again, option D should read B and C. There's a bit of a typo there. Okay, so the majority of you have answered, and we have 92% of you answering option D, which would be contraction of the abdominal muscles and contraction of the diaphragm. And so I'll give it right back to you, Chris. Yeah, sorry, Seth, for uh, jumping ahead there, but uh, excellent. Yeah, so both the contraction of the diaphragm and the expansion of the thoracic cage expand the, uh, the volume of the, uh, of, the thorac of the thorax and cause air to be drawn in. Excellent. Let's move on to um, all the different things that uh, we should consider in the pre-hospital setting. These are them on a the slide. And what I'm going to do is just go through trachea, lungs, and the heart, and go through each of those three things for those three uh, major players and uh, discuss them in uh, a little bit of detail. So let's start with the trachea. <clears throat> Well, let's start with foreign bodies, okay? What, is that, what does that look like? Well, in the foreign body history, usually either with the child or adult, in a child, the history is something usually like a, a child was unattended for a period of time. When the parents come back and take a look, the child got into a drawer and there's a missing battery, there's a missing uh, coin or something like that, or bottle cap or something, and now the child is having some noisy respirations and was having difficulty breathing. In adults, it's usually like that, uh, that case we had, a patient with some swallowing deficits or a patient that was uh, just eating or eating too quickly, and while they're eating, they get short of breath. On physical exam, what do they look like? Well, they have strider, so a noisy inspiration. They have audible wheezes as well when they're trying to breathe out. They have coughing and vomiting. And if that foreign body is lodged far enough down the, uh, the bronchial tree, then you get decreased breath sounds to, to one side. So down at the bottom here, I have in blue, one of the things that we can take to differentiate between uh, different uh, mechanisms of shortness of breath. For a foreign body, if a patient has strider and has a high risk, high risk story for it, then of course you can consider it. But as you'll see, there are many things that can cause strider. So it's not just strider, it's also that high risk story. Let's move on to croup. Well, croup occurs in children. So it would be very, very odd for you to consider that in an adult. Children usually get it with a viral illness. Um, so they have a viral illness prodrome. So they have a cough and a sore throat sometimes. And it's usually in the late fall or winter. And they're usually between six months to six years old. On physical exam, what you'll find with children with croup is a seal bark cough. And if you've heard that, you'll never forget it. And it sounds exactly how it sounds, uh, or how it's, uh, how it's uh, lifted. It sounds like a seal barking. They have a hoarse voice as well, uh, because their whole uh, airway is uh, inflamed. And they also have strider at some times, uh, because it's, uh, their airway is also inflamed. So again, these children can have strider as well, but the real thing that's going to be uh, tipping you off to a child with croup is that seal bark cough. How about anaphylaxis? Well, we've all seen or uh, read about people with anaphylaxis. They usually have a history of allergy, something that, they're, uh, that they know that a, a possible exposure to will give them an allergic reaction. But anaphylaxis is not just shortness of breath. There's also uh, other things involved with that. There's also gastrointestinal complaints, nausea and vomiting, also skin complaints of itchiness. And on physical exam, you'll see that with the urtic area, the hives. You see angioedema, the swelling of the uh, tongues and the lips, nausea and vomiting, as we mentioned. And if it's bad enough, you can even get shock, anaphylactic shock. You can have wheezing and they can have strider. So it's not that strider is um, pointing you one way or the other. 
but it can make uh, make you think that there's something's wrong with the trachea, an upper airway um, problem. Again, with anaphylaxis, it's a high risk story, and that cluster of symptoms of the uh, the urticaria and the nausea and vomiting and the shortness of breath with the possible exposure, all these things make you think anaphylaxis. So it's not just one thing, um, but it's a cluster of things. So Chris, what what's the best way to distinguish Strider from from Weegis? What what is the terminology there? How do how does one know it's Strider versus a Weegis? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, Strider um, is uh, noisy inspiration. So when a patient is taking a breath in, then you hear uh, a noise. Uh, whereas wheezes are on expiration. So when a patient is trying to push air out, then you hear this high-pitched sound or they're trying to force air through a tight passage. So I think that's the major distinction between them. And so when you, you hear stride, you're thinking more of, of the trachea, so your upper airway versus your lower airway. Is that correct? I would say so, yeah. So how do we treat all of these things? Well, for a foreign body, if the patient's still... Uh, Conscious, then you can do some BLS maneuvers, Heimlich maneuver to try to get the foreign body out of the trachea. If the patient's arrested, then you can try and attempt to remove the foreign body if you can see it. And even after removal, if they're still arrested, then you have to run a medical cardiac arrest. For croup, there's some things that we can do in terms of in the pre-hospital setting. Obviously, if the, if the parents uh, haven't tried yet, you can bring the child out to a colder environment and try to get the, the patient to breathe some cool air in. If that's not working, then we can uh, try and nebulize epi um, if, they're, if they're in severe respiratory distress. In anaphylaxis, we know that a patient has a auto in, their own auto-injector. They can use that, or we can provide them with our own IM epi, and we can give them uh, IV or IM back in the morning. All right. All right, so... Slide. That's our next uh, poll question. Yeah, you got that right, Chris. So I've launched the next poll question. Question here is, the major distinguishing feature of croup is, uh, op option A would be a seal bark cough. Option B is strider. Option 3, angioedema, or C. And option D is adult predominance. We'll give you guys a few seconds here to answer again. And it looks like the majority of you have answered, and 100% are answering uh, correctly with option A, the seal bark cough. Awesome. You guys are, uh, you guys don't need to listen to this presentation anymore, but uh, excellent job. Uh, definitely seal bark cough um, for croup is definitely the distinguishing feature. All right. Let's move on to lungs. Pneumothorax is one of the things that uh, can happen to our lungs. That's when air gets into that pleural space and collapses the lung down. This happens usually after blunt or penetrating uh, thoracic trauma, but it can also happen spontaneously with, uh, with a person that's high risk. And these are usually people that are tall, uh, you know, young men, but also with people with COPD when their bullae, um, uh, when their bullae uh, rupture and they can get uh, one distinguishing or one important uh, thing to remember is that you can have a tension pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax is when you have air accumulating in that pleural space and it accumulates but can't get out. And that air becomes under pressure and that pressurized air pushes against the mediastinum. And when you push against the mediastinum and the heart, and the heart's not going to pump properly and it can't pump blood to the rest of the body and you basically uh, have uh, shock, and then subsequently you can get cardiac arrest. These people usually have an acute onset of shortness of breath. They have chest pain, especially after a trauma, and they have decreased breath sounds by, uh, unilaterally because that lung is collapsed down and there's no air, there's no air going into that lung when it goes in. With attention pneumothorax, these people are acutely ill, in, a, in addition to all those things I said. And with the cyanotic and hypertensive. 
to the, the tension pneumothorax is one of those ones that makes you short of breath, Chris, if you were to see this in the emergency department. Definitely. They're, they're pretty ill, aren't they? Very ill. And uh, these people, they need to, obviously, they have that acute onset of shortness of breath and that high risk story uh, can, can um, uh, make you think about pneumothorax, especially that decreased breath sounds unilaterally is one thing that you look for. Okay, how about asthma? Well, asthma, these people have a history of atopy, so they have a history of, um, uh, of allergy, allergic reaction, um, eczema, and they have a history of puffer use in the past if they've been diagnosed with asthma. And the, the exacerbations of asthma are usually worse at night. And there's usually a trigger. Some pe they, patients usually know what triggers their asthma, whether it's an allergen that they're exposed to, or if they were exercising, or even stress can, can cause uh, an asthma exacerbation. I want you to pay attention to the physical exam of asthma and COPD because sometimes they can be um, somewhat similar. Both of them can have a cough. Both of them can have increased work of breathing. Um, they can both uh, be looking quite uncomfortable and have decreased air entry when you listen to them and have wheezing. But the major thing to d distinguish between asthma and COPD is that the high risk story and that population that they both have wheezes, uh, but again, it's a high-risk story for the asthma patient versus the COPD patient. So how does the COPD patient differ from the asthma? Well, COPD patients usually have a long pre-morbid course, a long history of smoking that's a cause of COPD. They have chronic cough from chronic bronchitis, and they're bringing up sputum and phlegm. And they're usually short of breath on exertion. So these people are short of breath all the time, usually. And when they try to do some, any form of exertional activity, they get quite short of breath. Again, their air entry is decreased, and uh, they can have wheezing and crackling sounds. These people, when they're having exacerbations, they also have this physical exam finding of auto peak. So it's sometimes they can be sitting up and in a tripod position. So their arms or their hands are rested on their knees, and they're sitting straight up, and they're huffing and puffing, and they have pursed lips, so they're breathing uh, with pursed lips when they expire to increase the intrathoracic pressure uh, so they can get uh, the air out. So they look different from a history um, and uh, on physical exam, although on auscultation, sometimes they can sound the same. So again, it's a high risk story and also that wheeze that gets you to think about uh, uh, COPD, uh, asthma, and pneumothorax. So how do we treat these things? Well, in the pre-hospital setting, if you suspect a pneumothorax, and if you suspect a tension pneumothorax, then a needle thoracostomy is what's indicated. In asthma, we provide uh, nebulized or MDI Ventolin. We don't use CPAP in these people because we, uh, we don't want to uh, air trap, so push air in that can't get out with the CPAP. Whereas for COPD, we can provide nebulized and MDI Ventolin as well, and we do provide CPAP for these patients. Okay, so I think it's time for our third poll. <clears throat> so the third question uh, of the webinar is, decreased air entry on auscultation can be found in which of the following? So answer A, pneumothorax. Answer B, asthma. Answer C, COPD. Or answer D, all of the above. All right, so it looks like almost all of you have voted, and we have 100% of you uh, voting the answer as D, all of the above. Well done. Uh, excellent, excellent, guys. Um, You're going to have to make the quiz harder next time there, Chris. I know. Okay, next, I promise, next question will be a little bit harder. Uh, so, yes, all, you can find uh, decreased air entry on all of the, uh, all of the presentations we talked about in terms of uh, the lungs. Let's move on to heart. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema is basically what we think about when we think about CHF, and that's fluid in the lung. There's a lot of causes for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That's basically when the heart's not pumping properly and blood backs up into the lungs and, uh, and 
and that uh, blood um, had an increased hydrostatic pressure, and that uh, hydrostatic pressure leaches fluid into the alveoli, and that uh, that fluid is causing uh, poor surfactant function and um, poor air exchange, poor gas exchange. That makes people short of breath. There's a lot of causes that can make uh, the heart not function properly. Infarctions, cardiomyopathies, valvular dysfunction, volume overload. And these people usually have history of heart dysfunction, you know, any type of heart issue. But really the exacerbations are uh, on history, a history of orthopathy. So when they lie down, they get worse shortness of breath. And sometimes when they're sleeping at night, they get paroxysmal or sudden nocturnal dyspnea. All of a sudden at night, they wake up short of breath. And that's because as they've been lying down, the, as they've been lying down, the, uh, the, the blood, uh, which has been pooling throughout the day in their legs, is accumulating back into their lungs because of their uh, dependent position these people again because of that baseline fluid in the lung get shorter breath on exertion so when they're doing going up the stairs or walking the block they get shorter breath often they're worse at night because of that lying down uh, and on auscultation you'll hear of crackles usually you can also hear wheezes as we mentioned and some extra heart sounds if uh, their heart's uh, not functioning one of the things I wanted to point out here though is sometimes we just lump heart failure with pulmonary edema. And that's not exactly true. It's usually left-sided heart failure that you'll get pulmonary edema. If you have right-sided failure, and if you think about the heart, the right heart receives blood from the venous system and pumps blood to the lungs. And if that side of the heart is not pumping properly, where's the fluid going to back up? The fluid's going to back up into the venous system. So you're going to see a high JVP, you're going to see leg edema, you're going to see ascites at some times, and these people aren't necessarily going to have pulmonary edema. So just be sure, just to uh, get clear in your mind, that heart failure, if it's left-sided heart failure, then you'll get pulmonary edema. Right-sided heart failure, you don't necessarily do so. So these people, they have a high-risk story, they have heart issues, and that history of the orthopnea, P and D, and the shortness of breath on exertion with the crackles bilaterally, that would make me think about a patient that has cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Okay, how about dysrhythmias? Dysrhythmias can definitely make you shorter breath. Your, your heart's going too fast or too slow. So too slow with the bradyhysrhythmias, dysrhythmias, too fast the tachy dysrhythmias. <clears throat> Let's talk about bradyhysrhythmias dysrhythmias first. These people usually have a history of conduction problems. So they have a history of uh, some type of uh, AV block, and they can have shortness of breath and even syncopal episodes because their heart's going too slow. On physical exam, really you're not going to find too much other than if you do an EKG, you're going to definitely see some changes. You're definitely going to see a bradycardia. And we don't have time to get into what those bradycardias look like, but you can definitely see some sick sinus syndrome, some AV blocks. So the EKG is really the thing that's going to push you towards a bright dysrhythmia. How about tachy dysrhythmias? Well, these people definitely have histories of similar episodes. You've all heard it, the patient that all of a sudden gets palpitations and they're tapping away with those SVTs. These people can be short of breath and have those palpitations, but it's the EKG. Again, the EKG uh, is what's going to point you in the direction of a tachy dysrhythmia. How about cardiac ischemia? That can definitely make you short of breath. People with chest pain or angina, when you look at them, you know they're short of breath. They say, oh, I can't breathe. But they have this chest pain associated with well. And sometimes people can have shortness of breath as an anginal equivalent. They don't have chest pain, but they have shortness of breath with their cardiac ischemia. They have a history of angina, and they've been taking nitro sometimes with their people with uh, cardiac ischemia. So cardiac ischemia can range from anything from a stable angina all the way to a ST elevation MI. These, pa these patients can have uh, a normal cardiovascular and respiratory exam. They may have extra heart sounds if their uh, heart's not functioning properly. And 
if they have ST elevations or ST depressions, they can have EKG. So these people, again, with a high-risk story in those EKGs, that supports your possible diagnosis of cardiac ischemia. So how do we treat these things? Well, if a person is in pulmonary edema, we can give them sublingual nitroglycerin if they decrease the preload, they decrease that pressure in the, in the lung and, uh, and uh, decrease the fluid there. If they're so sick um, and if their cause of their pulmonary edema is uh, ST elevation MI and they're getting shocked because of that and the heart's not pumping properly, then you give them IV saline and IV dopamine pumping more efficiently and effectively. For any dysrhythmias, if they're unstable, so if they're cardiovascularly unstable with their uh, slow heart rate, uh, you give them atropine. And if they're still not uh, looking too hot, then uh, you can call in to the base hospital for guidance. And we can do some transcutaneous pacing and also give them dopamine if required. With tachydysrhythmias, if they go in too quick, it all depends. Is it a narrow complex or a wide complex rhythm? A narrow complex rhythm and it looks regular, well, we can try a valsalva maneuver to try to get them out of that reentrant rhythm. Or we can give them adenosine. Now, if it's a wide complex, then we can call into the base hospital, just ask for some guidance. We can give some antiarrhythmics like amiodarone, lidocaine, or possible cardioversion. With cardiac ischemia, we can give ASA nitro, and morphine. Again, if they are having an ST elevation MI and they're in shock, we can give saline and dopamine. Okay, so it's time for our next poll. This one related to right-sided heart failure. <clears throat> so your right-sided heart failure presents with all of the following except. Option A is your elevated jugular venous pressure, otherwise known as JVD for the medics out there. Uh, option B, pedal edema. Option C, pulmonary edema. And option D, ascites. So remember, you're, you're answering uh, which of the following except. Okay, so we have most of you answering now. We have 69% uh, answering uh, answer C, pulmonary edema, and 24% answering uh, option D, ascites. <clears throat> so uh, that's right. So it is pulmonary edema. And so as I mentioned, um, right side of heart failure will cause uh, backup into the venous system and will cause elevated jugular venous pressure, will cause pedal edema because uh, the fluid is backing up into the legs on the venous side, and, and can also cause ascites uh, because the hepatic vasculature becomes engorged and uh, fluid can leak out into the belly. Pulmonary edema is left-sided failure. If the left side of the heart is not pumping properly, then the fluid will back up into the lungs, and that's when you get I'm just going to jump in here, Chris. We had a, a question from uh, one of the paramedics here asking, what is reactive airway disease? Um, and reactive airway disease, it's, it's a term that gets thrown around quite a bit, but it actually more refers to the, the pediatric patient population. And there's a, a group of pediatric patients that after a viral illness will become wheezy and get bronchoconstriction. Uh, so that's the, the main kind of uh, where that term developed. Um, there are, you know, subset of population, the adult, who similarly will get a viral illness or a pneumonia and become wheezy as well and get bronchoconstriction. And the question following that was, what is the treatment for this? So they would fall under the bronchoconstriction uh, protocol or medical directive, and the, the treatment would be uh, symptom, re symptom relief with Ventolin. Um, again, there are, are subgroups that will respond to it and a subgroup that will not respond to it. So. Uh, in the pre-hospital setting, if uh, mom or dad says their, their child has had wheezing before in the past, and, uh, I would go ahead and, and, and treat with um, ventilin.
Okay, so we went through all the major players in terms of the trachea, the lungs, and the heart, and we went through a three different things in each of those categories that could make a shorter breath. But I think, I'm, I'm sure as you guys have listened, that the main thing that's going to point us in one direction or the other is history. It's not really the physical exam that uh, that clinches or supports a diagnosis the strongest. It's really the history that gives you a diagnosis or a, a suspected diagnosis 90% um, of the time. And then your physical exam supports that uh, supposed diagnosis. So it's history, history, history. Make a good history. How's this patient presenting? Uh, and what uh, population they're presenting from? And again, when you meet a patient that's short of breath, stick a step back. Don't just jump straight to the protocols. Don't just jump straight to treatment. I'm talking to myself too because we just want to get these people feeling better. But take a step back, just a couple seconds, and think think through, okay, what are the major players that, that can make this person short of breath, and what is making this patient short of breath? Is it the trachea, thoracic cage, lung, heart, diaphragm, or something else? And if you got one thing that's pointing you to one direction, and your and your physical exam supports that, then you can try to then you can try to treat with uh, some protocol that that might apply. So again, start with the history, and don't start with the protocols. You want to fit. You want to make sure that the the right patient gets the right treatment. Don't start with the protocols I can provide. Try to fit a patient into those protocols. There's another question that that came in here, Chris, and maybe you can. Uh just uh, address this as well. Uh, for a patient in SVT who may be short of breath, you mentioned uh, one of the treatments which can be performed by the advanced care paramedics, which is a, a Valsalva maneuver. So for the ACPs out there, can you just again maybe describe some of the, the techniques for a Valsalva maneuver or what you would what you would tell a, a patient in the emergency department if you were seeing them, some of the things that you would instruct them to do to help them break this SVT? Sure. So. Um uh, I apologize for not going uh, through that in a little bit more detail. Valsalva maneuver is basically just increasing the intrathoracic pressure, sorry, intra-abdominal pressure, um, and that increases your vagal tone. And how I would tell a patient to do that in the emergency room is ask them to bear down and hold that bearing down for, uh, for a few seconds. And basically, as crude as it sounds, it's really asking the patient to imagine having a bowel movement and bearing down, try, like they're trying to have a bowel movement, and having to hold that uh, pressure, that abdominal pressure, for a few seconds. And that's how I would approach that. So if they're very constipated, so a <laughs> big, big, big push. Okay, deep breath in, just bear down or push down really hard. Correct. Um, another question that has come in, um, and it was asked, what's the best way to differentiate uh, a silent chest being caused by severe asthma versus that uh, caused by a spontane spontaneous pneumothorax? And uh, the answer to that, again, as what Chris was saying here, a lot of it comes from the history. So, again, spontaneous pneumothorax is that. It's just spontaneous. It just comes on all of a sudden um, out of the blue. So they're fine one minute, and then suddenly they become short of breath. Whereas asthma tends to be more of a buildup um, of, of, of over the history, they're getting more short of breath as time progresses. When it comes to the physical exam, uh, an asthmatic silent chest is going to be silent on both sides, whereas a spontaneous pneumothorax is going to be unilateral decreased uh, air entry. So you would be probably the most unlucky person to develop a bilateral spontaneous pneumothorax. So very very unlikely to ever occur. Right. Excellent questions, guys. Um, we're going to end it off with just one last case. So picture a 68-year-old gentleman. He's got a history of COPD. Um, you know, he's had uh, coronary bypass, uh, a triple coronary bypass, and he has anxiety. He's got hypertension. He's got type 2 diabetes. You know what these patients look like. Um, they have multiple comorbidities. This gentleman has a cough, though, and he's been short of breath for about two weeks, and he's now spiking a fever. He went to his doctor and put on uh, some unknown antibiotic, but even with that antibiotic, he's, he's got some congruent sputum, and his wife is calling now because he's, he's getting confused uh, with his, uh, confusion with his illness. Take a look at him and do some vitals. He's, he's febrile at 38.6. 
with a heart rate of 117, blood pressure is borderline at 96 over 74, rest rate of 25, and he's not satting very well at 89%. You think your physical exam might help you and point you in a direction, so you, you listen to his chest and he's got crackles and decreased air entry in the right lower lobe. And he's got wheezes bilaterally. Wow, so he's got lots of things going on. So what, what do you think is going on in this case? Well, well maybe he's, well maybe he has a pneumonia. He's got greenish sputum and he's spiking a fever. Well, that, that very well could be. Well, or maybe he's got a COPD exacerbation that, on top of that, because of his pneumonia, because he has a COPD history in the past and he's got wheezes. Well, that very well could be as well. Well, or maybe he's having cardiac ischemia well, he has an MI history in the past because of his illness that's increasing his metabolic drive and causing his heart to uh, beat faster. So now he's getting cardiac ischemia that's making him short of breath as well. Well, that definitely could be too. And now maybe he's dropping his pressure and he's getting short of breath because his heart's not functioning as well either. So all these things could be going on at the same time. Sounds like a train wreck there, Chris. <laughs> definitely does. And unfortunately, we do see these patients in the emergency room. And so you will see these patients in the pre-hospital setting. So the multiple diagnoses can coexist in the same patient. So although we've teased it out and, and uh, talked about how we can differentiate between the, some of these, um, uh, these uh, diagnoses that can cause shortness of breath, sometimes they can call, they can, multiple ones can coalesce in the same patient. All right, that's all I have for you guys in terms of this webinar. If there's any questions, we definitely like to hear them. So I'll, uh, I'll open this up right now to anyone who has questions either via the text box, so the question box that you can type questions into, uh, or if you have a microphone on your computer and you'd like to ask a question live, just click on the hand icon and then I will notice that and I can unmute you and you can ask questions live. Uh, I do have a question that's come through the chat box. The question is, uh, is it true that some CHF patients prefer to lie on their left sides? This medic has, uh, has heard that from a, a physician at, at one time. What do you guys think? That is a, a good question. I have not uh, I've not heard that or come across that in, in my training or any of my readings. Um, I know, Chris, have you ever heard that? Uh, Someone closer to the books? Honestly, um, no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't really heard that before. Um, I'm sure it works for some people. Uh, but the classic thing is lying, any type of lying down where they're, uh, uh, they're lying down flat uh, and the fluid redistributes to their lung, they definitely get shorter breath. So I'm not sure about that left lateral decubitus position, but uh, uh, no, sorry, Matt, I haven't really heard that at all. There's another question that's uh, come up. Can, Chris, can you slide back to the last case, case number four, on slide yep. 24? So the question is, if you wanted to apply CPAP to this patient, if we were suspecting pneumonia, should we not apply CPAP? Great question. Um, so in this case, the, the reason why we, we presented this case was to just to, to illustrate there's multiple reasons why someone can be short of breath. And often the patients that we do see have multiple comorbidities. And when someone becomes short of breath due to an illness, a viral illness, or um, a COPD exacerbation, other systems will come in play and attempt to compensate for that. So the best thing for these patients is to decide on which medical directive you will use to help alleviate their symptoms. Now in terms of if you're going to choose that, then if they have any contraindication for that protocol, then again, they will fall outside of it, even though you think most likely this, for instance, would be a pneumonia. If that is contraindicated, then you would not apply CPAP to this patient. Great, thanks Matt. Uh, another question's come through regarding the hypoxic drive. Now I can attest to the medics listening that in school we we're always taught, taught about the hypoxic drive and the fear of administering oxygen to those types of patients. Um, can you give us a, a little bit more of a realistic view of applying oxygen to a, to a patient who's potentially thriving off of a hypoxic drive? Great question, and that, this is actually um, a big in the pre-hospital research world right now, looking at the, the effects of 100% oxygenation on 
uh, multiple subsets of patients, including those with COPD exacerbations, uh, those with CHF and MI. And uh, it's starting to come to light that actually providing 100% oxygen may be more detrimental than good. Again, this is something that's very new and probably a few years down the road, but is being examined. Uh, there is a, a group of, of patients that do, um, do breathe off of that um, hypoxic drive, and they're, they're patients who tend to be CO2 retainers. So what happens with these patients is you play, apply 100% to them, uh, they are going to lose that drive to breathe. Now, this isn't just going to happen over a span of 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. This is the patient that is put on high flow oxygen or, or high amounts of oxygen, and they spend you know, you know, a few hours on that. Uh, they will, their respiratory depression will increase over time because they do rely on that hypoxic drive to initiate their breathing. And that's, again, long-standing issues of hypoxia and hypercarbia, which cause many uh, physiological logical changes and, and changes to the, the brain's ability to perceive uh, its need for oxygen and its its desire for ex exhaling carbon dioxide. Great, thanks Matt. Uh, another one's come through. So it's clear in our medical directives that we are not to bolus a patient who has crackles in their lungs. So that's clear to everyone. Uh, the question here is related to physicians in the eMERGE actually bolusing patients in CHF with crackles. Um, and the medic is wondering if that is sometimes a preferred treatment over dopamine more in the eMERGE setting as opposed to the pre-hospital setting. So in the emergency department, we're actually you know, blessed because we have multiple investigations available to us at our fingertips. Uh, so we're able to, to collect more information uh, about the history, or sorry, about the patient based on our physical exam, but other modalities like x-rays and ultrasound. So sometimes patients do come in with CHF and do have crackles in their lungs, but they're intravascularly dry. So we're able to determine this based on um, you know, laboratory investigations as well as our ultrasound. So sometimes these patients will actually receive fluids in the emergency department because they are hypotensive. So intravascularly dry. So they've third spaced all their fluid and that's why they have crackles in their lungs. So these are, are again very difficult patients to manage in the emergency department. So this is a patient who may be on CPAP in the, or BiPAP in the emergency department to help redistribute that fluid uh, in, the, in, the, in the lungs back into the vascular space as well as topping them up with fluid. So that's why you may sometimes see patients in, in CHF with crackles getting fluid in the emergency department. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I do have one person with their hand up. So, Dennis, I'll actually go and unmute you right now. So, Dennis, you are unmuted. Uh, if you do have a question, go ahead and ask it. Seems like it might have been a mistake, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yes, you, Dennis. Your hand is, is up. If you have a question, go, on, go ahead and ask it live. Otherwise, I will mute you again. Okay, so it seems like it was a mistake. Uh, so there aren't any questions uh, sitting in the queue at all. So I'll go ahead and wrap it up. A uh, huge thank you to both Matt and Chris for a great presentation. Uh, just some closing remarks in terms of upcoming webinars. Uh, just a heads up, if you're looking uh, for some information on what's coming up, uh, you're welcome to take a look at our Links newsletter article that goes out quarterly. Uh, we've always got a list of upcoming webinars, uh, so have a look at that. We don't normally have dates attached to them, but we do generally have the month that we anticipate offering that webinar. So just a heads up on what's coming. Uh, we have our ECG Part 2 of our three-part series coming up in April. Uh, part 3 coming up in May, along with a stroke webinar in May as well. We haven't done one in a while, so we thought another re review would be great. Uh, over the summer, we're looking at webinars on stress in EMS, uh, keywords in EMS, and then another anaphylaxis. Again, something that's really important, but we haven't done in a while. So once again, thank you to everyone for participating, for attending, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Have a great day.